England's glorious history has been steeped in ambition, greed, treachery and betrayal. Its castle walls have witnessed centuries of bloodshed. The anguished wails of the forlorn still echo through the corridors. Cut off by tragic death, these restless spirits have been trapped in limbo between heaven and hell. They have become the castle ghosts of England. Do you believe in ghosts? I do. Ever since at the age of six I ran panting downstairs and said there was a grey lady standing silent outside my bedroom door. I'm not alone. Forty percent of the English believe in ghosts and one in seven people claims to have seen one. Spirits continue to haunt us from the dim recesses of a darker history. Manifestations of the paranormal have many names in Britain. Wraiths, spunkies, chagrins, church grins, hags of the dribble. From the ancient druids to Dickens' A Christmas Carol, spirits have been a palpable presence in the English landscape. On the west coast of England's remote Cumbrian region stands Muncaster Castle, where two bloody murders triggered a series of strange events that cannot be explained. This rugged and beautiful landscape has echoed to the gruesome cries of the inhabitants of Muncaster Castle. Its walls loom over the treacherous quicksands of the River Esk in the valley below. Today the castle is plagued by eerie hauntings, odd happenings and disturbing manifestations. The present owner of the castle is Patrick Gordon Duff Pennington. There have been Penningtons here in this castle, I know, since the early 13th century. Do you think that the spirits, the manifestations, the spectres give the family special attention? I don't know. I like to think that they feel that we belong and we like to feel that they, we belong to them a bit. What kind of hauntings have people experienced here? Sometimes when I open the doors and open the shutters in the mornings, people pull the doors out of my hand. The last curator, he used to see a grey lady walking up and down the red passage outside our room. The tapestry room, people have slept in there and have asked to be moved. They hear people cry when they feel cold. They think it's a nasty place to be in. And people who feel anything at all, they come out not quite the same as they went in. Residents and guests of the castle also report the distinct sound of thumping on the stairs. Evidence of paranormal occurrences was so strong at Muncaster Castle that the family called in a team of specialists to investigate. On September the 18th, 1993, the experts set up an array of monitoring equipment for a scientific study of the hauntings. They waited for nightfall. At 10.40 p.m., the investigators felt the temperature drop dramatically. A minute later, a vase began shaking. Then a loud thud was heard, followed by three raps. The investigators noticed a movement past the door.
The team observed so many unexplained events that they reported it is hard to come to any conclusion other than that Munkester Castle is inhabited by supernatural energies. Not a few of the supernatural happenings have been attributed to a malevolent spirit that inhabits the castle. And in Munkester's long story, there's no more malevolent character to judge by events than Thomas Skelton. He was the last jester or fool to the Penningtons. He was known as Tom Fool and was responsible for the phrase Tom Foolery. He was also a steward of the estate. He was a trusted servant of his masters and a tyrant to those beneath him. He's said to have known Shakespeare, indeed, to have been the model for King Lear's fool. Malicious, vicious, witty, and cruel. No one could play a trick more thoroughly than Tom Skelton. He loved to sit under a chestnut tree near the castle and wait for passers-by seeking directions. Those he didn't like, he'd send to their deaths in the quicksands below. In 1585, a scandal broke around the daughter of the castle lord. Hellwise Pennington earned her name as a fiery, passionate and fatally headstrong young lady. Although betrothed to the son of a powerful neighbouring family, Hellwise fell in love with the village carpenter. But their encounters were not to remain secret. When word reached Hellwise's father, Sir William, he sought out Tom Skelton, meeting him here under what became known as Thomas's tree. He told him to put an end to the scandalous affair. Skelton summoned the carpenter to the castle under the pretense that he was to meet his beloved Hellwise. Once there, he plied the carpenter with cider until he was drunk and insensible. Then Skelton used the carpenter's own tools, a mallet and broad chisel, to hack off the young man's head. He was heard to say, when the lazy dolt wakes up, he'll have trouble finding his head. Always one to please his master, Skelton presented Hellwise's father with the young carpenter's head. History does not record Sir William's reaction. I thought it was rather silly, the story, but then, when we'd been here a little while, we used to work terribly hard, started in the office at six in the morning, and after tea, I would walk across the hall sometimes, and there were footsteps used to follow me. You don't think it could possibly have been an echo? No, I've tried that out. No, it wasn't. And I, I've tried it with sort of a shoes that didn't make a noise, but I always heard the behind me. The thumping heard in the hallways could well be the sound of Skelton dragging the young carpenter's body through the castle. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> my
and the mournful crying? Could it be Hellwise weeping over her murdered lover? Afterwards, the heartbroken Hellwise disappeared into a nunnery and eventually went mad. As for Thomas Skelton, he never paid for his crime, but fate has a way of meeting out justice. He drowned in the River Esk. Is Manchester still haunted by the presence of Tom Fool, waiting to play one last trick? Two hundred years later, these dark waters were to claim more lives and give rise to another apparition. One that prefers this road leading to Manchester Castle. Good morning. Grace Simmons, an employee of the castle, has seen the ghost. It would be about October in 1985 that uh, I've been out for a night and coming back up the road, driving up the road with my husband. And just come around the corner. And I saw this lady standing. She was leaning against the wall. And she seemed in distress, so I said to my husband, would you stop? And I'll get out of the car and go back and make sure she's all right. And yeah, we went back. When I got back to the corner, she'd gone. The woman in white began appearing after a gruesome murder in 1822. Love seems to be ill-fated at Munkester Castle. Mary Bragg, a servant in a nearby village, was madly in love with the castle's steward. But the housekeeper, a Miss Little Dell, had taken a fancy to the same man. One night her jealousy turned to rage. Two ruffians appeared at Mary's door. Concocting a lie, they claimed her beloved had fallen ill and she must rush to him. Alarmed, Mary went with the two men. She never made it to her lover's side. <laughs> Near a tree on the road through Munchester Wood, the abductors pulled Mary Bragg from the carriage. A pistol was rammed into her mouth. <laughs> but poor Mary's body had more indignities to suffer. To get rid of it, the murderers left it in a field for the castle dogs to devour. When that failed, they tried to find a hiding place. They hoped the waters of the River Esk would do their dirty work. But Mary Bragg's body refused to stay hidden. Months later it was found washed up, further down river, badly decomposed. At the coroner's inquest, a doctor claimed it was impossible to determine the cause of death. Some say he'd been bribed to cover up the murder.
But those involved with Mary Bragg's murder did not escape their fates. They met with bizarre ends. One of her assassins went insane, another was hanged as a highway robber. Mary's rival, Miss Littledell, who had hired the killers, became the subject of rumour and suspicion. Eventually, she was banished to a remote village where she was shunned as a murderess. The doctor at the inquest drowned in the River Esk, not a hundred yards from where Mary's body had been dumped. In 1993, the tree under which Mary Bragg died was cut down. The timber was reputed to be cursed. Blood began to ooze from the cut logs. No one locally would have anything to do with the wood. It had to be shipped to London to be sold. The apparition of the woman in a long white dress was seen on the very spot where the tree stood. Brutally murdered and mistreated in death, could it be that Mary Bragg still wanders in search of justice? No unearthly presence is more powerful than one that haunts Sewdley Castle in the southwest of England. Nestled amongst the rolling hills of Gloucestershire, Sewdley sits in an ancient wooded valley that has changed little since it was established in Saxon times. Today the grounds are known for their majestic oaks and deer-filled royal parklands. Sewdley Castle began as an extravagant royal wedding present in the 10th century. It went on to be owned by a succession of kings, including Richard III and Henry VIII. Despite its pastoral beauty, Sewdley Castle has a history of otherworldly events including the chilling discovery of the strangely preserved corpse of a queen. Some say these incidents can be traced back to a tragic event that resulted in an apparition which still haunts Sewdley Castle to this day. Aha, uh -huh. Peter Tarnwell. That's right, Miss Hardy. How nice to see you. Peter Timewell is the caretaker at Sewdley. He probably knows as much as anyone about the castle and its spirits. I know there are legends and reports of supernatural happenings, but do you think the place is haunted? Yes, I do. I get the general feeling, and so do members of staff and visitors, that there is something there. Employees report strange sights and sounds in the castle. The smell of an apple-scented perfume. The frequent forlorn sobs of a child. And the appearance of a tall, beautiful woman in a long green dress. Uh, you get the mystery of the lady in green is the key to the hauntings at Sewdley. Apples, yes. As Peter took me further into the castle, her presence appeared to become ever more tangible. This is the castle nursery. What a beautiful room. Feels very calm. Ah, oh, but this is where most of the castle hauntings are taking place. Can you account for that? Well, I put it down to our Katie. Who's Katie? Queen Catherine Parr. And this is her. Catherine Parr was a striking figure. Nearly six feet tall, with auburn hair, she was intelligent and artistic, a lover of music and poetry. She is famous for being Henry VIII's sixth and last wife. Catherine Parr managed to keep her head and outlive him. 
Catherine always had a passion for this man, Thomas Seymour. He was handsome, selfish, a buccaneer, a political adventurer. He was determined to be near the crown. After Henry VIII died in 1547, Seymour proposed to his daughter, Princess Elizabeth. When she refused, he turned to the king's widow, Catherine. They were married later the same year and came to live here at Sudley. Within months, Catherine was pregnant. At the age of 35, it must have seemed a miracle, and everyone in the castle prepared for the birth with excitement and celebration. Sudley's great banquet hall echoed with parties, music, dancing, and laughter. Then tragedy struck. Gloom silenced the castle. Catherine gave birth to a baby girl named Mary. But a week later, Catherine died from a fever. Mother and infant daughter were forever separated. But the tragedy did not end there. With Catherine barely dead, Thomas Seymour abandoned his newborn daughter and headed for London. Thomas Seymour went straight to Princess Elizabeth's bedroom and proposed to her for the second time. And the 15-year-old had the good sense to turn him down again. Undeterred, off he went and asked her half-sister Mary. She too turned him down. Thomas Seymour's lust for power in the end was to prove his undoing. Indeed, he was beheaded for treason. And when he died, Princess Elizabeth wrote, This day died a man of much wit and very little judgment. Catherine was buried in the chapel at Sudley in 1550. During Civil War, a century later, the chapel was ransacked. Her casket disappeared. 140 years later, a local farmer digging in the grounds came across a casket sealed in lead. He forced it open, and what he saw astonished him. The body of a woman, perfectly preserved, her complexion still milky white, her hair auburn. But within seconds the corpse started to wither and turn to dust and the terrified man hastily reburied the casket. It wasn't until a century later when this new chapel was built that Catherine Parr was finally entombed in a manner befitting a Queen of England. Apparently, Catherine Parr's spirit was not to rest. Margaret Parker, who's worked here at the castle for 23 years, is the latest witness to the Queen's return. Must be about nine years ago. In the middle of winter, the castle was all locked up. And it was just five girls and myself cleaning. And it was an artist upstairs in Catherine Parr's room painting. Knowing the woman artist was about, Margaret Parker wasn't surprised when she saw a figure standing in the window. Good morning. But the artist had only just come down from the nursery. Did she frighten you? No. Well, I don't think the dead can hurt you, can it? Unlike some ghosts, the former queen is a melancholy spirit who keeps to herself. But for those who live and work here, she's become a friend. No, no, Katie. After Catherine's death, her daughter Mary mysteriously disappeared from history. No one knows what became of the unfortunate little orphan.
Four centuries later, are these two tragic souls seeking reunion? As if to purge itself of sorrow, Sudley lay in ruins for 180 years. Then in the 19th century, Sudley came alive again. Restored to its former glory, it was once again a home. But with a new generation of owners came a new occupant from the spirit world. During the Victorian era, people were fascinated by ghosts. They were everywhere. To glimpse a spirit was to be reunited with a loved one who had passed on. It seems only natural that a Victorian apparition is behind Sudley's latest haunting, a haunting that has been witnessed quite recently. The present Chatelaine and owner of Sudley Castle is Lady Elizabeth Ashcombe, who hails from America. She inherited it from her late husband, Mark Dent Brocklehurst. There is, um, as I hear, quite a modern spirit that uh, is to be seen in the castle. Can you tell me about her? Well, um, her name is Janet and she was the housekeeper here for many, many years. She was here for 50 years. She came in 1896. My late husband, Mark, used to tell me stories about her when he came home from school, that she was still here and everyone's still terrified of her. And she was still ruling the roost with the iron glove. And so that's why I think she's still here. She just won't give it up. The upkeep of a grand Victorian household such as Sudley required armies of servants, housemaids, footmen and gardeners, all had their allotted place in the hierarchy. As housekeeper, Janet was in a superior position. Together with the butler, she was responsible for the strict running of the castle, ensuring that everything ran like clockwork and taking orders from the lady of the house. But her supervision didn't end there. In accordance with the rigid moral code of the day, she took particular interest in keeping the female workers chaste. Many of them were young, unsophisticated girls from South Wales who were away from home for the first time. Janet took it upon herself to safeguard their morals, sternly keeping amorous boys at bay. It was said that at night Janet stood watch at the top of the stairs, protecting the virtue of her housemaids. Even today, death has not loosened Janet's hold over her domain. Young girls who enter Sudley seem to attract the housekeeper's attention. As one teenager found out in the summer of 1993 when she was on a tour of the castle. At the heavily gilded gold frame, you will find a picture of... Suddenly, without warning, a strange feeling overcame the girl, urging her up the staircase.
Have you ever run into her face to face? No. No, I haven't. Um, but I feel, you know, that Suli is, to me anyway, is, is just always been such a, had a wonderful atmosphere. And, you know, I've often been in the garden, but there's a particular time in the evening when the light is at a certain level and everything like that. And there is this sense of timelessness here. Um, I can't really explain it, but one merges into it. And I think that all the people who've lived here, our presence is still somehow in this sense of timelessness. If Sudley's ghosts seem to linger out of duty or longing, that is not the case with our next castle. There, the letting of blood has spawned a legion of anguished spirits, for this is the Tower of London. For almost a thousand years, this revered landmark has been at the center of the grand drama that is English history. It is said, he who holds the tower, holds the power. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Royal Palace and Fortress of Her Majesty's Tower of London, the largest and oldest permanently occupied fortress in Europe. It covers over 18 acres, it took 200 years to build. It comprises of 20 towers, not one. Probably the best known, although one of the smallest, is the bloody tower here behind you. Two young boys have been glimpsed playing in the tower. They are believed to be the spirits of two princes, nine-year-old Richard and the heir to the throne, twelve-year-old Edward, the victims of a shocking crime. The boys were nephews of Richard III, England's favourite villain. Richard's enemies described him as malicious, wrathful, envious, little of stature, crook-backed. Still a controversial figure 500 years after his death. Some blame Richard for a series of treacherous murders, while others passionately defend him. What is known is that after the death of their father, King Edward IV, the two young princes were put under Richard's protection. Some say it was like assigning the fox to guard the chickens. For the princes stood between Richard and the crown. Richard had his nephews declared illegitimate and thus ineligible for the throne. He then confined them to the tower for their own safety, he said. For months they were seen playing on the battlements and in their room. But suddenly, in the autumn of 1483, the two boys disappeared, never to be seen again. No one knows exactly what happened, but with his nephews out of the way, the last obstacle between Richard and the throne was removed, allowing him to be crowned King of England. Forty years later, Sir Thomas More, himself later executed at the Tower, described in a book what he believed to be the fate of the boys. He said Richard had dispatched two of his men to the Tower. As the boys slept, they stole into the room. Then they smothered the two sleeping princes. More wrote, they gave up their souls unto the joys of heaven, leaving to the tormentors their bodies dead in the bed. According to More, they were buried under a great heap of stone. 
In 1674, workmen uncovered a chest just near here. In it were the skeletons of two children. In 1933, these were scientifically examined. From the bone formation and the structure of the teeth, it was concluded they were the skeletons of two boys, a 12-year-old and a 9-year-old, matching the ages of the princes. As befitting a future king of England and his brother, the two small bodies were interred at Westminster Abbey. But their hapless spirits linger in the bloody tower. Betrayed, abandoned, murdered, they cling to each other in death as they did in life. And the spirit that appears in this area of the tower is connected to another king's murderous determination. These rooms are the home of a particularly gruesome apparition. Anne Boleyn is the controversial figure in this story. Some champion her as a modern woman, vibrant, headstrong and intelligent. Her enemies saw her as an ambitious schemer with an arrogant, tempestuous spirit. Anne's boldness and independence enchanted King Henry VIII. The attraction would precipitate a major turning point in English history and a personal tragedy for Anne. The king was married to Catherine of Aragon but after 22 years, she failed to produce a male heir. For the young, flirtatious Anne Boleyn, it was easy to bewitch the king. He pined for her. He wrote her passionate love letters. Matters came to a head when she became pregnant. Expecting the son he so desperately wanted and needed to ensure the succession, the king convened parliament and had his marriage with Catherine annulled. And the divorce which followed caused the celebrated break with Rome and the beginning of Protestant England, of which Anne Boleyn finally became queen. But she gave birth to a girl, the future Queen Elizabeth I. Her second child, a longed-for boy, was stillborn. Henry grew tired of waiting for Anne to produce a son. His passions were aroused by a young lady in waiting, Jane Seymour. Where Anne had been the other woman, she was now the aggrieved wife. Anne had become an obstacle to Henry's dynastic ambitions. She had many enemies in court. Rumours of witchcraft, adultery, treason, even trumped-up charges of incest with her brother gave Henry the opportunity he needed. Anne was arrested and taken to the tower. Tried and found guilty, she was sentenced to be executed. As she awaited death, Anne had violent mood swings. One moment she was laughing, the next crying. Then a calm overcame her. She sent a message to Henry requesting that her head be cut off with a sword, not an axe. The axe was messy and often took more than one stroke. The morning of May the 19th, 1536, a flock of scavenging ravens gathered to watch as Anne Boleyn was led into the courtyard of Tower Green. When the inevitable moment came, the executioner readied the sword behind her back. Anne looked forward. And before she knew what was happening, eyewitnesses reported the executioner smote off her head at a stroke. Major General Geoffrey Field is Governor of Her Majesty's Tower of London. Do you know what happened to her body? 
Well, I know the story of what happened. Um, immediately after the execution, the executioner picked up the head and displayed it to the crowd who had gathered to see the execution. And the story goes that the eyes continue to move and the lips continue to move for several seconds after the beheading. The body was then um, put into an arrow chest. Apparently there was no coffin available for some reason. Uh, put into an arrow chest with the head tucked under her arm and she was then buried in the chapel of St. Peter at Vincula, which was immediately behind the execution site. Within 24 hours of Anne's burial, King Henry married his new wife. But headstrong in life, Anne Boleyn's spirit was not to be denied by death. An apparition has been sighted near where Anne spent her last days. In 1864, a Tower of London employee working there suddenly felt a cold mist around him. A woman's figure emerged. As the worker stood watching in wonder, the figure turned towards him. But where a face should have been, there was nothing. Do you believe in ghosts? There are things which happen to people. They haven't happened to me, but they've happened to my wife, for example, and other people I know uh, in the tower, which are difficult to explain um, by any sort of normal physical explanation. A frail apparition dwells in a parallel universe trapped between reality and the beyond. We've encountered some victims of England's long harsh history. Perhaps we better leave this haunted tower before we too lose our heads. Have we persuaded you that the castle ghosts of England are real? I'm convinced that right now, somewhere, a ghost is preparing to make its nightly rounds, and another haunting will soon be underway.